God's Word teaches that the Spirit is our teacher. He's the illuminator. But it also teaches that His ministry is hindered and short-circuited if there's unconfessed sin. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, shall not be moved. Come behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot with fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Our Father, we're just so thankful this morning that you are our present help in the midst of a troubled world, and indeed our world is troubled, but you are sovereign, you are ruling, and you have promised in this great psalm that there is coming a day when you will indeed be exalted among all the nations of the world. In your revelation, you tell us that happens when Jesus comes back. And so we're thankful that this nation called Israel that you used to bring about the first coming, you are setting the stage for his return. We pray for President Netanyahu today as he needs wisdom and grace dealing with a difficult situation. You told us that governments are raised up to curb evil, to protect people. And so we pray that you would help him to know how best he can protect the nation. Give our own president the same wisdom. We pray that you would deal with him for all the evil that he is propagating on our land and sanctioning the murder of innocent babies and encouraging what you call an abominational lifestyle. Father, our nation is apparently seemingly increasingly in ruin but we are thankful that you are over the nations of the world. And when men make their plans against you, you who sit in the heavens, you laugh. Now as your people, you have called us to be salt and light, and we know that is a growing process. So as we worship you this morning through your word, we ask that you'd open our hearts up to its truth. Help me. And speak through me by the Spirit of God, we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I want to invite you this morning to take a Bible and turn to the book of Romans, chapter 6. Last week, we just cracked the door in the sixth chapter by studying the very first two verses. The subject, if you remember, of Romans, chapter 6 is the topic of slavery. Not slavery by the chain, but slavery in the heart. When God uh, spoke of the Messiah, the Christ, someone asked me recently, what's the difference between the term Christ and Messiah? It was a good question, just two different languages. One is Hebrew, the other is Greek. Don't be afraid to ask questions. If someone laughs at you, they have the problem, you don't. And so when the Lord Jesus spoke of freedom, he spoke on one occasion to a great man of God, I can't wait to meet him in heaven. His name is John the Baptist, and John was in prison for preaching the truth about the Messiah. And some of his disciples came. If you remember, he ministered for a year before Herod Antipas came and threw him in jail. He's also called Herod the Tetrarch. There are seven Herods in the Bible. Threw him in jail and ended up, of course, beheading him. And Jesus told his disciples, they're called angels or angeloi, they're messengers, Tell John that the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised. 
the gospel is preached to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to prisoners. And so the Lord quotes from two different sections of the prophet Isaiah. Occasionally we'll get a question on the Bible line where someone will call in and they'll say, well, what's the difference between Deutero-Isaiah or Tritero-Isaiah? My pastor is making these comments. It's the difference between a Bible-believing Christian and one who doesn't ascribe to the authority of Scripture. So whenever you hear some preacher talk about two Isaiahs or three Isaiahs, you're sitting under a liberal. And that should be a red flag to you that he doesn't really believe what Jesus believed. Jesus attributed these quotations to the same prophet from two different sections. In fact, he quotes all three sections of Isaiah and attributes them to one author. And he says, say to John, tell them that I'm doing the things that the Messiah was said to do. The deaf will hear, the dead are raised, the lepers are cleansed, the lame will walk, and I'm proclaiming freedom. And so the natural question would be, well, what does it mean to pro proclaim freedom to prisoners? John's in jail, but John put it together. He understood because the freedom the Messiah would bring first and foremost is a freedom from sin. Jesus came not simply to deal with the penalty of sin, he came to deal with the power of sin. The doctrine of justification deals with the penalty of sin. The doctrine of sanctification deals with the power of sin. Justification speaks of our declaration of righteousness that happens in a moment's time, where sanctification deals with the declaration of our, not the declaration of our righteousness, but with the shaping of our righteousness. And it happens progressively over the course of time, especially as we learn these principles. One is instantaneous. The other is lifelong. And so justification is when he declares us righteous. Sanctification is when we in our experience become more and more what God has declared us to be. And someday those two will intersect, and we call that glorification, when the Lord will give us a body like his own. Becoming a Christian, in one sense, I suppose you could say, deals with the milk of the Word. So I'm a little hesitant to describe it that way, but I would describe it that way in that the gospel is simple enough that even a child can understand it. But I would say without apology that the doctrine of sanctification deal deals with the meat of the Word. Difficult truths that God wants us to know and to learn and to apply. Now, with that said, I want to begin in verse 3, where we left off last time, Romans chapter 6, starting now in verse 3. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now again, last week we looked at just the first two verses, but let me review the context so you know where Paul has been and where he is headed. If you remember, the book of Romans in, this, in the first eight chapters deals with three major doctrines. Having introduced the theme of the gospel, or the theme of the book, which he says is the gospel, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, he'll write, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And having established that theme, he then shows the need. And so in 118, all the way through chapter 3 and verse 20, he deals with the doctrine of condemnation. And he demonstrates that no matter who you are, wherever you live on the planet, whether you are a highly religious Jew, whether you are a raw pagan Gentile, you have the need for a Savior. And so then having established that need, beginning in 321 all the way through the end of chapter 5, so we actually, as a way of introduction to this series, we're calling it 
our identity in Christ were really men made new because when you're born again, you become a new person, a new creation. And your identity is the way you think about yourself. And just because you've been regenerated by the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that you're thinking your thoughts after God's thoughts, that you're thinking about yourself the way God now thinks about you. That's the growth process. That's why we need to get our minds renewed. And so he deals with this great doctrine of justification in the fifth chapter. And we saw our relationship to Adam that we send in and with Adam, but we have a new relationship in Christ. And then if you remember at the end of chapter 5 and verse 20, he reminds us that where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. That is to say, the more there was sin, the greater there was grace. And so we cannot say that Joe Blow doesn't stand a chance of being converted because he has come from such an awful home and such dire circumstances, because where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And so Paul knew, anticipating how men would respond to that statement, okay, Paul, if that's the way it is, if there's greater grace with greater sin, then it seems to me that this great gospel that you're preaching, justification by grace alone through faith alone, actually encourages sin. And so anticipating their objection, we looked at last time in chapter 6 and verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? By the way, there are people today who continue to attack the doctrine of justification by grace alone through faith alone. It costs somewhere between 30 and 40,000 preachers during the time of the Reformation their lives. They were murdered by the Roman church. And upwards of over a million people died because they refused to embrace the standard teaching of the church that you're not saved by grace alone. And so there's always been objections, even in our day, where people will say, well, listen, if I believed in once saved, always saved, if I believe that once I trusted Jesus as my Lord, that I'm secure with him, in Him forever, and then I'll just go out and get saved and sin all I want to. And a gentleman said that to me one day. He said, that just encourages people to sin all they want to. And I quickly responded, well, I sin all I want to, and I don't want to, because I have a new want to on the inside. We studied that last time from Titus 2. The grace of God that has appeared bringing salvation to all men so the doctrine of a particular or limited atonement is a slur on the character of God. And sadly, there are many in the Reformed faith who say that Jesus didn't die for everyone, but only the elect. Jesus died for everyone. He brought salvation for all men. But Paul then goes on to say it teaches us, that is, those of us who've been born again, to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. And so what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? And so chapter 6 continues the argument. So Stephen Langton in the 1600s, if you've taken the course in bibliology, you remember that he was responsible for putting the chapter divisions in the New Testament. They said he was on a long journey in a horse and carriage and maybe hit a bump in the road and he said, I think I better end this chapter here. But that was his division. It wasn't Paul's division. Chapter 6 flows right out of chapter 5. It's great that there are these divisions because we couldn't find our way around the Bible so quickly as we do. But you don't want those divisions to distract you because they are artificial in nature. So if we're sin increased, grace abounds all the more, then why not persist in sin that grace might increase? That's called antinomianism. And so the Roman Catholic Church said that the Protestants of their day were antinomianists. You know what that word means. It's an important term, anti, like we speak of the antichrist, right? He comes against Christ and he comes in the place of Christ. The, the prefix anti in Greek means in the place of or against. And then the word nomos, law, so antinomos, antinomianism, is basically saying that you're saved by grace, but you don't have to follow the law. You're going against the law. And of course, Paul will attack that false doctrine when we come to the eighth chapter. But people, sadly, in practice, even in our evangelical churches, say they don't believe that. But that's how they live. They join a church sometimes without 
any kind of research, and yet they have a lifestyle that contradicts the gospel, either in appearance or in action. They join the church, they sing in the choir, they serve, but they live a double lifestyle. And sadly, in some churches where they are aware of these things, they don't do anything because they don't take seriously Christ's command on church discipline. And so there are, again, people to our day, they say more sin, more grace, greater sin, greater grace. Why not just sin it up so that God can grace it up? And what's Paul's response? Verse 2, we looked at it last time. May it never be. May genoita. There are different English translations that try to capture those two words. You'll read depending on your English Bible. Absolutely not. Of course not. Not at all. By no means. Perish the thought. Don't be ridiculous. God forbid, the King James says. The CEV says, no, we should not. The Living Bible says, of course not. The Phillips translation says, what a ghastly thought. And if you were in our Wednesday night service, and I want to encourage more of you to come to Wednesday night. I know some of you have little children and you can't come, and 7 o'clock is bedtime, and I get it. But you could live stream, and there is a a depth of issues that we can cover on a Wednesday night that I can't always do on a Sunday morning. But if you were here three weeks ago on a Wednesday night, we talked about the difference between a version and a translation. So we speak of the King James Version or the New American Standard Bible Version, the NASV. A version is a, a rendering of the original languages into the receptor language, in these cases English, done by hundreds of translators, where a translation is done by a single person. So the Living Bible translation was done by one person. In fact, he didn't even know any Greek or or Hebrew, though he did run to people when he got stuck. Uh, Maybe one of the worst ones ever done was called The Message. When it first came out, I thought, oh, Nav Press, they've got a, a translation done by Eugene Peterson was terrible. First, I thought, oh, it's good. Nav Press, you can trust it. Just read his rendition of Romans 1 or 1 Corinthians 6, and he eradicated the sin of homosexuality. How convenient. And that's only the start. And in the course of bibliology, I walked through some of the heresies that he propagated. And so there is a benefit to a translation One of the reasons the Living Bible was done was for those individuals who had only a first grade education, and it gave them an opportunity to interact and read the Scripture in a way that they can understand it. But remember, any translation, a paraphrase, is interpreting for you what they think it means, and so you're once removed. So he says, notice verse 2, may it never be, how shall we who died to sin, still live in it. Shall we sin that grace may increase? Not on your life. That's a perversion of the grace of God. In Jude's words, that's turning the grace of God into licentiousness. And of course, we've seen that sadly in Hillsong and Bethel through many of their leaders in this new movement called the New Apostolic Reformation Movement. They're turning the grace of God into licentiousness. Look again, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? Have you forgotten that you've died to sin, Paul is saying? You don't want to go around sinning every chance you get. You've died to sin. And the emphasis of the verbs in the Greek New Testament are a little more fluid. You might render it. But how shall we, being who we are, still live in sin? The thought is if you belong to the king, then the lifestyle that you live should be commensurate with the king to whom you serve. And so a growing believer, we're not only to be saved by grace, but we're to grow in grace, grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ Jesus. Peter will write, a growing believer hates to taste, to smell the touch of sin more and more and more. And so he is going to, in this sixth chapter, teach us how to respond to our new master. Now that the Lord Jesus has dealt with the penalty of sin, that's the gospel of justification. He now wants to preach the gospel of sanctification. Many a believer knows the gospel of justification, but they haven't moved very far into the gospel of sanctification. 
And so he wants to train us how to deal with the power of sin. Notice verse 3, how it begins again. There are three key words that explain how to live victoriously in Christ. The first word is the word know, or do you not know? You should circle that if you didn't circle it last week. He does not say, or do you not feel, or do you not experience, but rather he says, or do you not know? He is saying, aren't you aware of the fact in your thinking that there's some information that needs to reverberate in your heart. There's something that you need to know. And so he begins verse 6 with the word knowing, and again in verse 9 with the word knowing. So if you're taking notes, the very first point there in your outline concerns our new realization, our new realization. There's something you need to realize. There's something you need to know some truths that apply to you if you've been born again. Now, here's the problem. When we become a Christian, we receive a new nature, a new capacity to live righteously that we did not have before the second birth. However, with that said, that old fallen Adamic nature is not dissolved. It's still there. And so God wants us to understand that with this new nature, it can rule and reign over the old nature. Its authority died. And he says, if you don't know that, then you might drag it around like a man might drag around a corpse. And so the question you need to ask is, how do I, as a Christian wanting to walk in victory, handle this old nature in light of the fact that I have a new nature? Now, last time we spoke about our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln. We're in January 1st, 1863. He wrote the Emancipation Proclamation. Though Lincoln signed it on January 1st of 1863, they didn't hear about it in Texas until June the 19th. And so we speak of Juneteenth. It was on June the 19th that the message got to Texas. And until June the 19th, the African Americans were living under slavery. They did not know, though legally they were declared free, they lived as slaves because it was something they did not yet know. There are many believers like that today. There's a truth that God says, this is true of you. But if you don't know it, if you don't realize it, if it doesn't penetrate your soul, then you might live in a spiritual slavery of sorts. That's his point. Look again at verse 3. Or do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. Now, while we're here in verse 3, I need to just run a little detour because this is a favorite verse that people use to teach that baptism saves. And so when we look for people who leave here and they're going to another part of the country for a church, we'll open up the doctrinal statements, and one of the things I'll look at is baptism. And if under baptism they have Acts 2.38 and Romans 6.3, then I know that that's not a church I want to send someone to. Because, and again, there's exceptions to the rules, so if you're listening to me, save your notes, save your emails, save your letters, I'm not interested. But typically, Church of Christ, the Christian church denomination, and Disciples of Christ teach that baptism is necessary in order to be saved. And they'll use verses like Acts 2.38 or this verse out of its context to teach that. Now, the word baptizo is a transliterated word. And if you were here four weeks ago in the Wednesday night service, we talked about what a transliterated word was. A transliterated word is when you take a word from the original and you just translate the sound directly into English. We do that with a lot of words on both sides of the Bible, like Bethel. Uh, Bet is the word house, El is God. Bethel literally means the house of God, but we just render it Bethel or uh, Sabbat or Sabbath. It means rest. We don't typically translate it. There's Barabbas or Barnabas, names like that. Uh, Someone wrote me a letter this week and they signed it Maranatha. Now the word Maranatha is actually a an Aramaic word. If you remember, the Bible's written in three languages, right? For the most part, the Old Testament in Hebrew, the New Testament in Greek. Though there are several chapters in the Old Testament that are written in Aramaic, which was the trade language of the day. So when you're in places like Daniel and so forth, that's important. And then there's a few sentences and a few words here and there in the New Testament that are written in Aramaic. 
Well, Maranatha is an Aramaic word found only once in 1 Corinthians 16. So he signed it Maranatha. Mara means our Lord. Atha means come. So it's, it's a prayer. Come, Lord. And that's what we pray, right? Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. We want him to return. The church has prayed that for 2,000 years. And so there are words that are transliterated, and so sometimes in transliterating them, the meaning, be it literal or whether it be um, a word that has a, some kind of symbolic meaning, doesn't always come through. Now, people debate why baptism, baptism was transliterated. And some would say, well, King James made sure it was transliterated. If you remember, King James was responsible for the translation of the King James Version. So we speak of the authorized version. What does that mean? It was authorized by the King of England. And of course, he represented the Anglican Church. If you remember, if you stepped back a little bit, you have King Henry VIII. He's a Roman Catholic. He'd been married a bunch of times. The Pope said, we can't give you another divorce. Well, you can't give me a divorce. I'll make my own church. So he creates his own church with his own pope. We call him the Archbishop of Canterbury. And of course, when King James comes along, they had been using the Bishop's Bible, but the English was becoming so archaic because the language was changing so fast. And even if those of you have a King James Version in your hands this morning, you're actually reading the fifth revision, the 1738 version. You probably couldn't read the 1611. I struggle with it. Very difficult because it's... English has changed so much. God's word has never changed. But sometimes our language changes, and so a good translation tries to put in the receptor language what word represents that Greek, Hebrew, or Aramaic word. And because infant baptism, of course, was predominant in the Church of England, it still is in the Anglican Church, the Episcopal Church. Anglicans typically teach that you're regenerated in infant baptism. Really? That's interesting. You're regenerated, you're born again in infant baptism. That's what they teach. Now, there's exceptions to the rules, so save your letters. But they would say because the will is in bondage, then you need to have infant baptism so that the will could potentially be freed, that that individual might hear the gospel. Well, that's true, but that's not how God does it. And so you can't find one half of one verse in all the Bible where an infant is baptized. Peter says, look... These people, just like us, received the Holy Spirit like we did. How can we refuse baptism to them? Acts 10, Cornelius and his household. We can't. They've been regenerated like us. So first you're regenerated, then you're baptized. That's the order. But the word baptizo means literally to immerse. And it has a literal and a figurative meaning both literal and figurative. For instance, in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 2, it carries a figurative meaning of being identified, in that case, with Moses. Let me read 10.2. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now, even though they didn't go under literal water in the name of Moses, when they followed him, they were identified with Moses. They were baptized into Moses when they crossed the Red Sea, by the way, on dry ground. And there were walls of water. So when, again, the liberal would say, I had a liberal at Boston College and said, well, it's not the Red Sea, it was the Reed Sea. And it wasn't, you know, a wall of water that was probably a foot deep. He's not talking about the Reed Sea. He's talking about the Red Sea. But again, if you want to argue the miracles away from the Bible, you can find ways in which to do that. But this is one of many words in the New Testament where they walk through on dry ground. He's not talking about water. They're talking about because you identified yourself in faith with Moses and you followed him through that sea, you were delivered by God's almighty hand. There are other passages very, very clear, like 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. There it is. For by one spirit, we're all baptized into one body whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we're all made to drink of one spirit. My point is, whenever you see the word baptism, don't immediately think water. 
The context must determine it. There's no water in 1 Corinthians 10, 2 in terms of anyone getting wet. And Paul in spirit baptism in 12, 13 is basically saying that when you get saved, you're born again, you become a temple of the Holy Spirit. Under the old covenant, God had a temple for his people. Under the new covenant, God has a people who are his temple. And so we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Why? Because we've been made to drink of one Holy Spirit. We're brought and bled together under the blood of Christ and what he has accomplished. We're identified in Jesus Christ through the indwelling presence of the Spirit. Oh, you can read what John says in Matthew 3 and verse 11. He speaks of a baptism with fire. And of course, it has nothing to do with some of our dear charismatic brethren who said, well, this is speaking in tongues. All they had to do was read the next verse. He's talking about the fire of judgment. Some people will be identified with God in judgment, not in salvation. Jesus spoke in Acts 1.5 that they were to wait until they received the baptism of the Spirit. Don't go out and preach. And most of you know, I think, that neither a thimble full, nor a cup full, nor a tank full, nor an ocean full can ever wash away your sin. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 17, Paul said, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So he theologically separates baptism from the gospel. Christ did not send me to preach, to to baptize, but to preach the gospel, meaning the baptism is not part of the gospel. Well, what is the gospel? In the 15th chapter, he says it's the death, burial, and the resurrection. I delivered to you as of first importance the gospel. Matthew 3 calls baptism a work of righteousness. And the scripture says he saved us not on the basis of works or deeds that we've done in righteousness, but how? According to his mercy. So just keep that in mind when you come to Romans 6. He's not dealing with water baptism. Now, it's a good illustration. We often use it as preachers of new life. We baptized four new believers today, and when they went down and up, They were confessing, they were bragging on Jesus. That's what you do when you get baptized. You're not bragging on yourself, you're bragging on Jesus. I'm going into heaven because of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. It's something you do after you're saved. Well, not only does baptism look at justification, it also looks at sanctification, and by the way, it also looks at glorification, just like the Lord's table does. Each of those two ordinances look at all three aspects of our conversion, but he's going to focus on the aspect of sanctification here. If you go to the Jordan River, it's called Yod and Nad. Here's a picture. There's a wall, and um, the, the wall that I wanted to show you, the picture was all fuzzy. So on one wall, they have all these passages, uh, this passage from Mark 1, 9 through 11, And it's in all these languages of the world. It goes that way and it goes that way. And on another wall, they have Romans 6 and verse 3. And the implication is is that when you get baptized via water, that you're going to be identified with Jesus. That's certainly not true. Yadonet, it means little, little Jordan, literally. Now, we used to baptize here, but then when the country of Jordan negotiated with Israel, we actually now baptize in the area where Jesus himself was baptized and when John the Baptist was baptized. But the point is, is that water baptism, while it typifies spirit baptism, water baptism does not regenerate you. And that's a heresy. You say, well, that's a small thing. Well, it's not a small thing to the Apostle Paul. Paul said in Galatians, if you add any work to the finished work, you're preaching a different Jesus, a different gospel. So it's not a small thing. So to teach that water baptism is essential for salvation, that it saves you or washes away your sin, is to make void in the argument of Romans and Galatians and Ephesians and really all the New Testament, the grace of God. Now, baptism by the Holy Spirit is how we are identified with the Lord Jesus. And so in Ephesians, it affirms that when Christ died, I died. When Christ was buried, I was buried. When Christ was raised, I was raised. So that Paul can say, we're seated with him in the heavenly places. It seems to me like I'm standing on a platform in Beaufort, South Carolina. But in terms of my identification with the Lord Jesus, Paul said, I'm already seated with Jesus in the heavenly places. And so he's going to drive home an important identification truth to us here this morning. 
Look at verse 4. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism, spirit baptism, into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So normally when we think of water baptism or even spirit baptism when we're born again, because again, when do you receive the Holy Spirit? Ephesians 1, 13 to 15 says, the moment you believe. In him you also, having heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed, you are sailed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's why when we come to Romans 8 9, he'll come and say, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not one of his. So we typically think of spirit baptism only in reference to the penalty of sin. But Paul now wants us to understand a second level of identification as it concerns the power of sin, the power of sin. So as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Now, there's two words in the New Testament in common Greek or kane Greek for new. There's the word kainos and there's the word naos. There's the word naos that means like newness in time, like a new day. But then there's the Greek word kainos, and that's the word that he's using here to speak of newness in character or a new quality. And so he's underscoring that when you get saved, you have a new quality of life. This is the promise of the Old Covenant given, uh, given in the Old Covenant of the New Covenant given in Ezekiel 36. God will give you a new heart. He'll take your heart of stone and he'll give you a new heart. And so the Scripture says in 2 Corinthians 5 that if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation or a new creature, depending on your English Bible. The old things have passed away. Everything has become new. Paul will say in Galatians 6 that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, but being a new creation is everything. And so Paul is just underscoring here, here in the gospel of sanctification, that when you are identified with Jesus in salvation, you have been raised to walk in newness of life. And he is going to try to drive that point home to us so that we can live in this newness of life. Look at verse 5, he further explains it. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, we know that he died, didn't die for most of my sin, but all of it, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. He's saying that we can have a new walk, we can have a new life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So now he proceeds to unfold exactly what he means by it. So follow carefully. In verses 6 and 7, look at your text. He's going to speak about the significance of Christ's death. Then in verses 8 and 9, he is going to underscore the significance of his resurrection. And then in verse 10, he's going to bleed the two truths together. So follow closely. Look at verse 6. It begins, knowing this. Again, he's not speaking about some feeling. He's speaking about something we must know. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. Now, if you have the New American Standard with marginal notes, and if you come to meet the pastor, you'll be blessed with a, a complimentary copy You'll notice that sometimes that when there is a play on words in the Greek or maybe a more literal rendering, they'll put a little footnote and you go out into the margin and they'll give it to you. Sometimes it's a little wooden to put the literal rendering in the English text because it just doesn't flow well from the original language into our language. And so they'll maybe, I don't want to say doctor it up, but they'll soften the hardness of it. But if you go out into the uh, marginal note, in fact, it reads this way in the King James, verse 6 says, our old man was crucified with him. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, technically nothing, except if you weren't sensitive to what's being read here, you might think that this is not a generic verse, and it is. The word here for man applies to women and men alike. You could say our old man, or you could say our old woman was crucified with Jesus. And so most of the newer translations will say our old self. So when he says your old man, he's not talking about your daddy. I know that was a disrespectful way people referred to their, to their parents or their dad sometimes. But no, he, he's talking about your flesh. 
And so the term flesh in the Bible sometimes, in a few cases, refers to the skin that covers this skeleton. Occasionally, it refers to a worldly perspective, a worldly point of view. But most often in Scripture, when you see the word flesh, it's referring to that fallen propensity to do what is wrong, our sinful nature. So think about your old man, about your old self for just a second, your old woman, we could say. First of all, he's a dumb old man. Remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they're spiritually appraised. Before we're born again, we're pretty dumb spiritually. Now, God can give you enough insight to get saved, but most of the spiritual truth that you will hear will just go right past you, or you might even rebel against it or make fun of it. Why? Because a natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God. Until you have a birth from above, your ability to absorb spiritual truth is limited. So he's a dumb old man. Not only is he a dumb old man, he's a dirty old man. Listen to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. There he says, do not love the world. And the world here means not the people of the world but the world system, which Paul says is being energized by the evil one. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And so our fallen sinful nature loves sin. It enjoys sin. That's just what it does. In Hebrews 11 and verse 25, it says that there are pleasures in sin for a season. So don't ever tell someone when you become a Christian you lose your appetite for sin. It's called temptation. And if sin was not pleasurable, there would be no temptation. But it's only for a season. It robs you in the end. So he's a dumb old man. He's a dirty old man, but he's a deceitful old man. Again, notice what Paul says here in verse 6, knowing that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we should no longer be slaves to sin. He's dumb. He can't comprehend spiritual truth. He is deceitful in that he'll try to get you to believe that you're being ripped off and robbed. You said, well, you know, the, the devil is tempting me. To, you don't need the devil to tempt you. You can be carried away, Paul, James says in James 1, just by your own fallen nature. And he enjoys sin. Dumb, dirty, deceitful old man. And so Paul says, I want you to understand something about this old man, this old self. Knowing that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we should no longer be slaves to sin. And when he speaks here about this sin-dominated body or our body of sin being done away with, the King James says destroyed. Done away with or destroyed could be misleading in some people's thinking, no matter what translation you read, and that he is not saying that it is eradicated that it is gone. In fact, I like actually the older translation of the New American Standard, 1978 edition, where it says that your old man was made powerless. In other words, it doesn't disappear when you're born again. You still carry it. When I became the pastor of this church on the first Sunday, I still have the bulletin. The offering was $1,826, and there was 147 people present. And on the first Sunday, seven people left. I didn't know there was a problem in the church. I preached on confession of sin. And these people taught that there's no need to confess your sin because once you're saved, you don't sin anymore. You just make mistakes. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. But Paul wants us to understand that that old fallen Adamic nature was defeated, it was disabled, it was deprived of its power. One translation says, made powerless, again, like the old NAS. The HCSB says it was abolished. The ESV says it was brought to nothing. The King James says it was destroyed. That is, it was rendered inoperative in terms of its power over your life. Now, by the way, Paul uses the same word that's rendered, as I just shared, destroyed, brought to nothing, made powerless, in another passage of Scripture. And let me just read it to you because it might shed some light for us. In 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 1, he makes this statement, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many 
wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. You know, the 21st century evangelical church, we've been under the false impression, if I can get this politician to become a believer, or this uh, well-known sports person, or this wealthy guy who has all this influence, that we're going to turn the world around for Christ. Paul says it doesn't work that way. He says, just think about it, and this is true wherever you go in the world. Among any congregation, there is not many wise according to the flesh. They're not all super educated with three PhDs. There's not many mighty, not many noble. But God, he says, has chosen the foolish things of the world. God's not a respecter of persons, but those things that he has just highlighted very often are stumbling blocks that keep people out of the kingdom of God by their own choice. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. I spoke to a pastor not that long ago, and he said, well, he said, I'm hoping to change the complexion of my church. I said, what's wrong with it? He says, it's blue collar. So I'd like to get some more, you know, white collar people in it. I said, well, you shouldn't be a respecter of persons in the sense that God wants to win the poor and he wants to win the rich. But if you think getting white collar people, highly educated, mighty and noble folks into your church is going to turn things around, you've been deceived. Because God doesn't typically do his work through such people. He can Paul being a case in point, Lady Huntington, who is of, of course, English nobility, good friends with George Whitfield and, and uh, John Wesley, she said that she was saved by the letter M in the Bible. She said, it doesn't say not any noble or any mighty, but not many noble, not many mighty. And indeed, she was right. God has chosen the base things of the world, and the despised God has chosen the things that are not, so that he might nullify. There it is. Same Greek word, make inoperative. The same verb, kartageo. That he might nullify the things that are. Your sin nature is still there. But God has made it inoperative. He has brought it to nothing, so to speak. He's made it powerless. Maybe I can illustrate. When I first got married, my wife and I, she married a guy who owned a 1972 Volkswagen. Um, it had no air conditioning in it. And we were living in North Carolina. We come back from our honeymoon. Of course, we're, we're headed on our honeymoon. And my father-in-law says, you know, you're, you're going into 117 degree weather. The day we got married, it was 103 degrees in North Carolina. And literally, we went through 117 degree weather. People all across the nation died that year in 1980. I had no air conditioning, but we came back to a sweaty 1972 Volkswagen bug that had no gas gauge. I had a 59 Volkswagen before that, and it had no gauge at all. Um, I, I say my 72 had no gas gauge that worked. My 59 had no gas gauge at all. And so when you ran out of gas down by the high beam button, there's a little thing on the floor that you pushed. There was a, a switch that you just kicked, and it opened up a reserve tank, and it gave you another 30 or 40 miles to go. So with this 72 Volkswagen, no, the gas gauge was broken, the float was broken, no money to fix it. And so I would kind of guesstimate when I was going to run out of gas. And I usually would give myself, you know, 30 miles. So one evening, we went out for dinner and got some groceries and went to the mall and walked around, didn't have any money to buy anything. But as we get back in the vehicle, my wife says, uh, Carl, don't you need some gas? I said, no, no, we, 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 got, we got plenty of gas. We're, we're just fine. You know, there's a reason our wives are called helpmates, to help some of us stubborn, hard-headed guys. And so we're heading home, and just as we were cresting at the top of the full hill, <laughs> And it quit. I threw it in neutral and coasted down all the way to the bottom of the hill right into a 7-Eleven gas station. It's magnificent. <laughs> Ain't God good, right? Now, my car had experienced car to get all. 
That is, it was chugging along, and then it was rendered inoperative. It was made powerless. Now, it wasn't destroyed in the sense that we were still sitting in a 1972 Volkswagen. But without any gas in it, it had no power. When you get saved, you still have your old fallen Adamic nature. So you don't want to gas it up. You don't want to feed it in Romans 13 and verse 14, make no provision for the flesh, that is for the socks, your sin nature, in regards to its evil desires. You want to leave it on empty. And so Paul is going to teach us in this chapter of Scripture steps and things that we need to be aware of so that we don't feed that old nature. Look at verse 7. For he who has died is freed from sin. Please notice it doesn't say free to sin as his accusers had falsely stated, but he who has died is free, f- freed from sin. In other words, you no longer have to be a slave to sin. So don't ever get in your mind, well, I'll never change. I'm always going to be this way. You begin to think that way, and you're like putty in the devil's hands. God wants you to realize you now, with this new man, have the capacity to make good choices. And so to help us to understand this, in verses 8 and 9, he now elaborates on the implications of Christ's resurrection. Notice verse 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, it's an if statement, and there are four different kinds of if statements in the New Testament. And when you take first-year Greek, they teach you four classes of conditional statements. And one is what's called a first-class conditional statement, where... It's, it means something that is assumed to be true. If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into loaves of bread, or at the funeral a few days ago. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. He's writing to the church at Thessalonica who are trying to put together not the doctrine of the resurrection. They believed that. Well, they didn't understand it was the order of the resurrection and what would mean for some of their loved ones who already had died. And he says, if we believe Jesus died and rose again, you say, well, why don't they just render it sense? Well, some English Bibles do. But he said, if, why did he go to that length? Because he wanted to get the reader to stop and to think. If we believe Jesus died and rose again, yeah, I believe that, Paul. That's my testimony. And even so, God will bring with him from heaven, absent from the body, present with the Lord. He'll bring with him those who've already gone home, and he'll put that person back in the body and raise it up. In fact, they're the first to go up. So he's saying here, If we have died with Christ, and we have, if that's true, then pause and think. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And so he's going to unfold for us this new life, not just in terms of glorification, but this new life that we share in terms of sanctification. Knowing that Christ, verse 9, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, Death is no longer, death no longer is master over him. He's reminding us that the power of sin has been broken. There's coming a day when, again, justification and sanctification will intersect, and your sin nature will be forever gone. But between that time, he wants us to know that the power of the sin nature has been rendered useless. Knowing, there's the word again, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. Christ, of course, was not resuscitated from death like Lazarus, who died a second time and was buried again in Jerusalem or in Bethany, probably. No, uh, Jesus was resurrected. The first fruits of those who have died The first one ever to come out in a resurrection body, never ever to die again. And so he can say, death no longer is master over him. Now notice verse 10. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead assures us that this emancipation proclamation is now in action. It can never be rescinded. Now, I know what people are thinking as Paul is writing this. Well, this is just theory, Paul. This is not my experience. So he brings us to the second point. 
he gives us our new consideration. Beyond our new realization, he wants us to think about our new consideration. I told you the first key word was know or knowing, repeated three times in verse 3, verse 6, verse 9. You have it, no doubt, underlined or circle. The second key verb is consider. Here in verse 11, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. God is asking us to consider. The Old English says reckon. Uh, The word reckon in the South has a colloquial form to it. My wife was playing for me uh, yesterday a, a, a video in the car of her mother, and her mother answered her question by saying, I reckon so. Uh, is it going to rain tomorrow? I, I reckon so. It might or it might not. And, but this word that is used here, logizomai, has a lot more steel and concrete and substance to it. And so he is affirming here, you need to reckon something, you need to consider something to be true. In fact, this word logizomai, you can almost hear our word logic, logiz, logic, the word logic or the word logical. In fact, we get our word for, say, an airplane log or a ship's log that basically recounts the progress. And and Paul is asking us to consider to, to do some spiritual evaluation here. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, what does it mean to be dead to sin? Well, he has just said in verse 6, so that you should no longer be slaves to sin. The thought is that you're freed from sin's control. If a freed slave on June the 19th is in Texas standing right before his master, and that master is yelling out orders to him, he doesn't have to obey because he's been freed. He can now make a new choice. That master no longer has control over him. And Paul just wants us to know that we are no longer under the reign of sin as a master. We have a new master, but you need to think about this. And really think about it in other realms of the Christian life, things that you reckon or consider to be true. For instance, Suppose this this week you say, I feel very unacceptable to God. You stop and you pause and you think, ah, but Paul said in Romans 15, 7, therefore accept one another just as God also accepted us to the glory of God. I am accepted in Christ. It's not a matter of feeling or I feel inadequate. I just feel so inadequate. Then you say, well, now, wait a minute. God said something about inadequacy, didn't he? Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. Oh, yeah. Or I, 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 I just feel alone, totally alone. Now, wait a minute. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. I feel loved. Wait a minute. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us. That's the supreme act of love. I feel afraid. Wait a minute. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So how do you know those things to be true? By faith, you let God renew your mind, and by faith, you embrace those things. Even so, consider by faith yourself to be dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Listen, God is not asking us to play some word game here. This is not Joel Olstein in the power of positive thinking. This is a truth that God himself is giving to his people that he wants us to embrace. We are to consider, reckon, count ourselves as dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. I mean, think about it. How do you know that your sins were forgiven? How do you know if you're saved this morning, you're not headed towards hell? How do you know that you've been declared righteous? By faith, you reckon it to be so. That's the gospel of justification. Now in the gospel of sanctification, God wants you to reckon the truth 
that sin no longer has its authority over you. And if you let it, it's because of either ignorance or lack of faith. So it starts with knowing and learning the truth. But then by faith, we have to apply the truth. It's like endorsing a check. If we believe the money is really there, then we'll sign it and we'll collect the money. Suppose I'm a slave and my master is yelling orders at me over my coffin. He can yell all he wants. I'm dead. His orders are meaningless. And so part of the growth process in sanctification is to disarm the lie of the evil one who has convinced some of you, you'll never be different. You're always going to be this way. And God wants you to know, no, you don't have to be this way. Now, he's going to teach us when we come through the rest of the chapter and on to 7 and 8, the means that God gives us so that we can be liberated. But if you don't believe you're liberated to start, You'll never seek that means. And so your slavery is not mandatory. Paul is going to argue it's voluntary. And so a growing and maturing Christian is learning to find out what God says about the old man. So think your way through this. The first instruction is that of something we need to know. No, knowing, knowing, three times. A new realization in the mind. The second key word is consider. There's a new consideration that has to unfold in the heart. But there's a third word we need to think about that's equally important. And we'll come to that next time, God willing. Our time has slipped away, so how are we going to apply this? Let me make some simple applications. Number one, remember that casual thought is not the same as deep thought. Casual thought is not the same as deep thought. Casual thought will not bring any real life change. Remember who's Paul's audience is in Romans 1 and verse 7. He writes to all who are beloved of God, called as saints. While God loves the whole world, only his people are called his beloved. And the verb beloved is only used of God's people. I love the kids in our neighborhood, but I don't love any of them the way I love my own. And God loves the people of this world, but if you've been born again, you become a member of his beloved. And so you see, it's possible to have had enough of truth, to the truth of the cross to justify you, but a limited amount of truth so that you're not being sanctified. And so he's going to unfold for us that you need to really think about this. This is a truth you need to get into your heart. Remember Psalm 1, it says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in it he meditates day and night. It'll be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. Jeremiah uses that same imagery, by the way. Which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. You know, whatever he does, he prospers. By the way, that's one of eight psalms our children learn on Wednesday nights. You should have your children in those children's choirs. So you just can't casually think about this. Take some focus, which leads me into the next point. Bible truth learned and not lived out means little. Bible truth learned and not lived out means little. Truth that's only in the head, that's purely academic, will never change your life until it fleshes itself out in the will. Paul speaks in Ephesians 6 of doing the will of God from the heart. Satan doesn't care how much Bible truth you learn. If it's academic truth and it's not active truth, he's won the Bible. You can come and take notes, and you should. You should underline your Bible. But that in and of itself doesn't make you spiritual. Four years ago, this month, we're in the book of James. For if anyone, he says, is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he's looked at himself and gone away, he's immediately forgotten what kind of person he is. James is saying you need to be doers of the word. You can't just be auditors. I took a course in Koine Greek before I went to seminary at Duke Seminary, you know, you, 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 Duke Divinity School, you, you, you can't mess up Greek, though it was a liberal apostate denomination and seminary. It was awful. I, I tried to win as many of those future Methodist pastors to Christ as I could. 
But as I took that Greek course, I audited it because I could audit it for free as a campus pastor there. Now, the rest of the students in the course were sweating bullets every day. But I'd go into the course, and I was just an auditor. No tests. (laughs) It was lightweight. And the churches in America are filled with auditors. They're just here to listen. But they have no intention of doing anything with it. And he's warning here, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man. Many of you, if you remember, the word for man here speaks generically of a, of, a, of a male. He's like a male who looks at his face in the mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he's immediately forgotten what kind of man, he, or what kind of a person he is. So there's two different words for man. There's the word anthropos. We get our word anthropology. Applies to men and women alike. And then there's this gender-specific word, arnair, that refers to the male sex. You know how long? I got up at 5.15 this morning. How long it took me to shower, shave, put my suit on, grab a cup of coffee and get in the car? 15 minutes. And sometimes that's a problem. Because I come to church and I still got shaving cream in my ear. (laughs) My tie's not straight. My zipper's not up. You know, that's every pastor's fear. You know how long it took the average woman to look in the mirror this morning? We like the difference. God made a woman differently than a man. We like that difference. But James, because he wants to underscore the truth, most of us, men and women alike, are like literal physical men who look in a mirror. And we look, but we've forgotten some of you tomorrow. If someone asks you, what did your preacher preach on? You couldn't recall if your life depended on it. For once he's looked at himself and gone away, he's immediately forgotten what kind of person that he is. But by contrast, one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. This man will be blessed in what he's done. James is saying you really need to look hard when you look into the Scripture. And that's exactly what Paul is going to underscore. There's something that we need to know, we need to consider. We can't just glance at this. We need to let this truth reverberate in our souls. Third and finally, without the second birth, real change cannot even begin to take place. Look, unless you're born from above, you'll not go to heaven. Let me give you the short version of the Bible. There's one problem, it's sin. There's one villain, it's Satan. There's one hero, it's Jesus. There's one purpose, and it's to the glory of God. You and I have sin problems And we can't fix it unless we want to fix it eternally in a place called hell. And Satan will convince you that you can fix it, that you can earn and merit heaven. But Jesus is the hero of the Bible. He came and paid the penalty. And if you will call upon him in faith, he'll give you a new life. You'll be born from above. And then and only then will you have the capacity to begin to grow. Now, our Father, we thank you for the time we've shared this morning in your word. I pray for someone listening to me who's really not sure that heaven is their home because they're not sure they're righteous enough. Help them to see they can never achieve the righteousness necessary. You remind us over and over again that this is a righteousness that is gifted from above. Help someone to call upon Jesus to turn from being their own Savior to saying, Lord Jesus, by your death and resurrection, save me. Now, Father, I know most in this auditorium and in our adjacent auditoriums, they've made that decision. They've heard the gospel of justification. We just pray and ask here in the days ahead as we work through these portions of your word that deal with our new identity, that you would help us to understand the gospel of sanctification. 
that we might be shaped and changed more into the image of Christ. Help us not to be satisfied where we are at, but excel even more. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? We'll sing a hymn of invitation. If you're here and you've never openly, publicly confessed Jesus as your Lord, I want to invite you to do that. If you've never been baptized as an emblem of your salvation, I want to encourage you to do that. If you've been saved and baptized and you don't have a church home, well, if you know Jesus, the Bible says you're not ashamed of him. And so I would invite you to come. If this is a place where you can grow and bring your friends, then you come as well. Matt's going to lead us. We're going to sing all four verses of this as an act of worship. But if you have a decision to make, step out and meet me here in the front.